Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Badun, you're watching Israeli News Live and uh, I'm going to go into some very interesting things this evening, friends, and I, I decided to take this route here because I know it creates a lot of confusion for some people when I'm trying to call out um, things that uh, the Israeli government may be involved in doing that uh, as a Jewish guy that is a believer of Yeshua, a supporter of my people and my country, things that I don't agree with. Uh, you have to remember, it's no different than um, being an American citizen, which I am first an American citizen by birth in America. Uh, I don't agree with the Obama administration and the things that are going on in America. Uh, does it mean that every policy that Obama has done is wrong? I, don't, I wouldn't say that necessarily, but clearly a lot of things that he's doing I definitely don't agree with. And even as American citizens, many of you guys are as well calling out, doing videos constantly. Why? Because the core value of American principle was a Christian nation to begin with. And slowly but surely, it's turning completely opposite almost to that I don't know if you'd want to say if it's becoming an atheistic country or if it's becoming a Muslim country. Not because of the people in it. The people in it are still a huge majority of Christian people that are there. But it's the leadership that's leading the nation really in a very dangerous direction. And Israel is pretty much no different. And not to say that we have all bad leaders. I don't think that either. I think we have some good leaders in politics as well in Israel. And, but the thing is, is we've got to really take a step back and when we see something that is not right, we have to call it out. And there was some, definitely some controversy with people when I made the comment using this article earlier today uh, that they say, oh, this, again, Iranians are saying it, it can't be true. And I stated, even myself, I know for a fact, firsthand testimony uh, from uh, IDF, uh, people that, that, are, that have been in the military that shared with me their own story that they knew, and this was two years ago, that there were known to be known to be those among the ISIS groups there that had been wearing tzitzit. Tzitzit are the uh, tassels on the four corners of the garment there. Uh, so this is why I actually shared it with you. But not only because of that, you know, I have been exposing the Vatican's role trying to take over Jerusalem and through the sons of the lawless, as Daniel states in, in, the, in the 11th chapter, I believe around the 16th verse there, where Daniel writes about the sons of the lawless of your people will try to marry the vision. Now, you're not going to get that in the King James translation because it doesn't translate it quite like that, but that's literally what it says. The sons of the lawless, I think you have the robbers of your people. Your people are Daniel's people, which were Jews. Okay, Israelites, Hebrews, the robbers, our own people would be robbers. They would try to do what? Marry the vision. What vision was that? That was Daniel 9.24. They're trying to bring about a reconciliation for iniquity, which is what the Pope of Rome has been working on with the Mechodeshet. So even going all the way back to the Oslo Accords and, and, and of course, uh, Barry Chamish, late Barry Chamish, a good friend, uh, we've worked together before trying to expose evils that are going on. Guglio Miotti, uh, an acquaintance friend that uh, we've had Guglio on before, exposing the evils that are going on in Israel. You have to understand, if I don't get my people's eyes to open and to wake up of the evils that are happening through some of the wicked inside of the government of Israel of what's going on, then how are they ever going to recognize their own Messiah when he comes? You know, we've got to be honest and truthful if we expect God to be honest and truthful with us. We've got to make the right stand somewhere. So let's take a look, though. And these are things I've brought out in the past as well, including veterans today. Uh, and this article here, of, it's an older article, though. It's from 2015. It's October of last year. Actually, it's a, just a year old now. Uh, the, the, the headline was, it's an update article, actually, of another article that they released, Israeli General Captured in Iraq Confesses to Israel-ISIS Coalition. Okay, now, they state in here, if you move down into here, the editor's note, Israel's claim that Shehak uh, 
is only a kernel requires us to at least publish this claim of theirs. It may well be important to Tel Aviv that a colonel was caught rather than a general. This reminds me of the Battle of Stalingrad and Hitler who uh, promoted General Paulus to field marshal, um, uh, promoted should be a demotion, field marshal in the, in the belief that field marshals didn't surrender to Netanyahu. It, it, it is obviously a belief that generals don't get caught, uh, at least to Netanyahu, that generals would not get caught. So, but anyway, the, when Veterans Today had published the article about uh, Shehak and how he was captured and confessed that the Israelis' involvement in ISIS, uh, you know, the Israelis even, you know, contacted them and said, you know, he's not a general, he's a colonel. All right. So it's not denying the fact of what the story states. It's saying that who he is. But let's look at what is stated here. There is a strong cooperation between the Mossad and ISIS top military commanders, Israeli advisors helping the organization on laying out strategic and military plans and guiding them in the battlefield. All right. General Shahak was captured by the Shiite militia and still being held in Iraq. Now, I don't know if he is by now. Maybe it's, it's been a year later. Maybe there's been some, some trade-offs since then. But anyway, his captors are keeping uh, DESI informed, a European security organization with, uh, with close ties to VT, which is Veterans Today. The article below is based on questions we submitted to his captors this morning. We also inquired as to the conditions under which he is being held. All right. So they were wanting to know, and this is the one right here. Uh, the Foreign Minister and European Department of Security and Information Secretary General Ambassador Dr. Hussein Bo said exclusively confirms to veterans today that Israeli Brigadier Yusi Elon Shahak captured by the Iraqi Popular Army confessed during the investigation that there is a strong cooperation between Mossad and ISIS top military commanders asserting that there are Israeli advisors helping the organization on laying out strategic and military plans and guiding them in the battlefield. All right. Now, granted, if a man is captured in this area, he might confess to things under torture, duress, etc. that may not be even true. But we also have to ask ourselves the question, why do we have an Israeli commander, whether you want to call him a colonel or a general or whatever you want to call him, why is he there in Iraq in the first place in Western Iraq? It's no doubt an operation going on, a covert operation that went kind of sour because he got captured. All right. So the fact is he's there, he's captured. That tells us something's going on. The Israelis are involved in, in that area. And I'm not saying that Israeli undercover operations and stuff for the security of the nations are not warranted. I'm not even saying that if the people come against Israel, that we have, do we have the right to defend ourselves or not? Sure we do. I am for that. I understand that. What I'm speaking about is when the nation is getting involved in things, especially in this issue going on with Syria, you know, and even as far away as Mosul, what business do we as a Jewish nation have involved in this? I mean, we're supposed to be a beacon of, uh, of hope, the light of the world here at the end of days. And yet we're involved in all kinds of clans and, and clandestine operations that are clearly a new world order operation. Now, Okay, I didn't just, Veterans Today is not the only source. I want to share with you more information here. Here we have on global research. Israeli military admits to supporting Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria. That's an interesting one, isn't it? All right, now this is on, uh, this is back, uh, let's see, uh, Washington's blog is where it came on first, July 23rd of 2015. The alternative press has noted for months that Israel is supporting jihadists in Syria, but Israel has consistently denied these allegations until now. And when they talk about the alternative press, I was saying it two years ago. All right, two years ago, we already had the intel on this and we knew it. But, you know, yeah, Israel has not admitted it. I, and I can't I blame Israel for admitting everything that they do. Yes, you just don't go away giving your positions on everything. I understand that. I have a respect for that. I just simply say that as a Jewish man, as a believer, you know, I've been offered my citizenship for Israel as well from the Knesset itself. 
Okay? So I stand there with my people, but there's some things that I feel like we have no business being involved in. And this whole toppling of ISIS is a new world order project. Israel has no business being involved in that. That is the Pope's plan of what they want to do, a new world order. And you're going to get some of that information in just a few moments here. All right. So anyway, the defense minister, Moshe Yolan, okay, Moshe Yolan, former defense minister now, said Monday that Israel has been providing aid to Syrian rebels, thus keeping the Druze in Syria out of immediate danger. Israeli officials have previously balked and confirming on the record that the country has been helping forces that are fighting to overthrow Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, or Bashar Assad. We assisted them under two conditions. Yolan said, the Israeli medical aid to the Syrian rebels, some of whom are presumably fighting with Al-Qaeda affiliate Al-Nusra Front to topple Syrian President Bashar Assad, that they don't get too close to the border and that they don't touch the Druze. Okay? Al-Nusra is Al-Qaeda and closely affiliated with ISIS. Remember, there have never been any moderate Syrian rebels, only Islamic Sunni jihadists, the article writes. All right, as Vice President Joseph Biden admitted, the fact of the matter is there was no moderate middle. That's what, that's what Joe Biden says. Allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. They poured hundreds of millions of dollars of thousands of tons of weapons in anyone who would fight against Assad, except that the people were being supplied were al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, and the extremist elements of jihadist. So, yes, Israel has been involved. Now, I didn't even know about this article here. I found, my wife found this one and sent this one to me here. Veterans Today, I reported this already a good while back. Now, let me, let me share with you something else. Now, this is Avi Lipkin. He is on Prophecies Watchers. Um, when this came out here, I want to play a little clip here because I think it's very important that you see this at the 820 mark. And I'll include the links here for you to be able to see this. And I'm also going to include some links where we uh, interviewed Avi just recently here ourselves about Russia and this conflict in Syria. All right, so let's take a listen to Avi right here and getting big enough on the screen so you can see. Uh, allied with the Russians. Uh, the Shiites hate the Sunnis. They hate ISIS. And there's a very, very strong blood covenant now between the Russians and the Shiite Muslims fighting the Sunnis. And, of course, the Americans, the Europeans, and the Vatican support the Sunnis against the Shiites. Now, it is uh, now. supporting Bashar al let me pause it for one moment. Did you notice who he says, you know, Russia supports the Shiites. And, of course, Putin is supporting Assad. He supports Iran. These are all Shiite nations. And there's only, in, in, in Syria, there's only 10% that are Shiites. But 50% of the nation actually back Bashar al-Assad. And those are made up of the Christians, it's made up of the Shiites. It's made up of the, uh, uh, of, um, the Druze. Now remember, even Israel said, don't touch the Druze. Leave the Druze out of this. But the Druze support Bashar al-Assad. All right? But did you notice who he said backs the Sunnis? Now that's very important. You get this part. So let me, let me uh, make sure I don't pass where I'm supposed to be out here. I really want you to see what he says here. So let me back it up just a little bit because you've got to hear this. It's very important. And there's a very, very strong blood covenant now between the Russians and the Shiite Muslims fighting the Sunnis. And, of course, the Americans, the Europeans, and the Vatican support the Sunnis. The, the Americans, the Vatican, and um, i got to play it again. I always miss that one word in there, so let me bag it up again. Sorry about that, guys. Let me listen. So the Shiites again. are totally uh, allied with the Russians. Uh, the Shiites hate the Sunnis, they hate ISIS, and there's a very, very strong blood covenant now between the Russians and the Shiite Muslims fighting the Sunnis. And of course, the Americans, the Europeans, and the Vatican support the Sunnis. Americans, Europeans, and the Vatican support the Sunnis. And it's always been known. The Vatican has always supported the Sunnis. They are the ones that created this group to begin with, uh, according to Alberta Rivera. And something else we've exposed for years. So, if, you know, if you guys have been listening, you're new to the, our broadcast, I've done a lot of in-depth exposure on the Vatican and their involvement with the uh, 
uh, Sunni, uh, the, the, basically the, the Muslim religion altogether, uh, Muhammad, etc. We've, we've brought a lot of this stuff out. And uh, as well, uh, you know, we have really been exposing Rome's involvement in taking over Jerusalem for themselves. This is why uh, they brought the Rothschilds in, etc., for the creation of the state of Israel. Yes, God promised in his word that we would return to our homeland. But you have to understand, God also, he knew that there would be an evil in behind trying to set up the state. But God knew that we would come back home. And he knew that our people would get there. But if you knew what it took for this to first get started and the evil that happens there, God knew that as well. That's why he wrote it in his word. That's why he wrote it in Daniel and said about the sons of the lawless and how they'll try to marry the vision. But that's not God's way of doing it. God will still work out his own way with Israel, but we're trying to expose the way that the sons of the lawless are doing. And that's even in the government. Even in the government, we have the wickedness that can be there as well. And I, I've, I've really been hoping for the longest time that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu would not be part of that. And I felt like maybe for a while, maybe he would not be. Uh, but more and more, it's concerning me the way it's going unless God opens his eyes to what the truth really is. All right, so let's continue on here for a moment. Assad, who is an Alawite, is, is he supporting the Assad uh, regime? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what's his goal there? Uh, first, you have to remember one thing. If uh, the Bashar al-Assad regime represents 10% of the population, which is Shiite, Alawite, 10% of the population, which is Christian, mm -hmm. the Christians are totally, totally allied with Bashar al-Assad. Then you have the Druze. I don't know exactly what percentage, maybe 2, 3, 4% of the population of Syria is Druze. Uh, the Kurds are in the north. And now they're kind of like out of the picture, but they were part of the Bashar al-Assad minority scheme. In other words, Bashar al-Assad represented 50% of the population in which there were Sunnis also. Some of the rich, very established Syrian Sunnis, they were part of the Bashar al-Assad administration. The 50% of Syria, which is anti-Assad, they are all totally Sunnis. Okay, so the Russians are against the Sunnis. So the and so what do, they, what do you have when you have that 50%? That the, the Sunnis. I have a feeling that a lot of the Sunnis, and I don't know this as of yet, I need to do a little bit more research on this, but I wonder if the Sunnis w w didn't end up being the refugees sent out. Uh, don't know as of yet, because they may have left the Shiites behind in order for them to ki be killed. Just like the Vatican and the United States, the Obama administration, would not rescue the Christians out of Syria. They would rescue Muslims, but they would not rescue the Christians. They left them there to be slaughtered and murdered. Why? If they can kill off the people there that support Bashar al-Assad, then it makes it easier, even if they did do a quote-unquote democratic election, then, they, then Assad would lose. Kill off his supporters is what they're trying to do. The same with the Kurds. Why do you think Turkey keeps attacking them? Oh, the U.S. says we back the, we back the Kurds. You know, even, even Russia, supposedly, it would be on the Kurdish fighter side. Syria finally says to Turkey, if you bomb them again, I'm going to shoot your planes down. You know, why did Assad do that? Because... He knows that the Kurdish people are what help keep him in power as well. That's what give him that little edge of the majority there. And this is just a little over that 50%. But the United States wants to change all of that. But look at the war plan. Look at the game they're playing there. They're doing it intentionally in order to change that plan completely and totally 100% altogether. Now, I want to take you... Um, to the next video here. And again, it's with Avi Lipkin this time. Um, he is uh, on our inter the interview that I did with him here in Jerusalem just recently here. Let me take you to this here, to the 850 mark here. And, Shiite Sunni war. And um, we're looking at the Shiite, Sh Sh Shiite Sunni war. Again, he's talking about the same thing. We're going into that. We're going to go here for almost a minute here to listen to what he says here. Because in this one here, Avi is going to tell you that it is to, do, to bring about the New World Order. Watch this. 1,400 years, they're killing each other. 
America and the one world government support the Sunnis because they do business and they make a lot of money with the Sunnis. And so the Sunnis see U.S. and Europe as proxies. And Russia, which also had some problems with the Shiites, but primarily had problems with the Sunnis through its support behind Iran and the Shiites. And so you have a thousand years of Russia fighting the Sunni Muslim Turks. And you look at the Black Sea, for example, that was a Turkish lake. And the Russians came down over the centuries and defeated the Turks. And now, you know, Chornaya Moria, the Russian sea, Chornaya Moria Mayo, my Russian, uh, my, black, my Black Sea. So the Turks want to go back. They want to take it back. And they want the American and European support to do this. And Turkey is a member of NATO. We shouldn't forget. Well, you know that Ukraine is, uh, because uh, See, that's what's really interesting right there. As he stated there, you have to remember that Turkey is a part of NATO. And Turkey, they are the Sunnis. So even though Russia is trying to make an agreement here uh, with uh, President Erdogan of Turkey, Erdogan is still doing calculated moves. And I think this is where you're going to find your Gog and Magog. And I, you know, I was hoping to bring the Gog and Magog out today, only to find out I accidentally deleted my notes yesterday. So I've got to restart this again, and hopefully I can get it together by tomorrow evening at the latest uh, Tuesday. I will have it up by Tuesday, God willing. So pray for me. And I haven't forgot the one on the Mark of the Beast either. I will be bringing that out as well. I have addressed this before, but I want to do it afresh because of things that I'm seeing. Uh, and, and, and so we'll go into that a little bit later. No, I'm only going to be going into one aspect with that. Uh, but, but anyway, as I, as I come back here to, to Turkey, um, I realize that, yes, Turkey signed a, a deal with Russia for the gas pipeline to run it through Syria. And, but I keep watching the advancement of Turkey. And you got to remember, Assad just said the other day on Swiss television that Turkey's presence, presence in his country is an invasion. All right. So Assad, no doubt, and Russia maybe not be are on, their own, on the same page. Russia is tolerating the presence of Turkey inside the country, but he's only doing that because the relationship was somewhat mended uh, with Turkey after the supposed coup. Uh, again, let the, let Syria knock down a Turkish plane, then you're going to see. The United States, all of NATO will come barreling in uh, right here into the region. And, and guys, I realize, listen, I know that we have the Russian uh, flotilla that is headed that way. Uh, here on your screen here, for an example, we mentioned this the other day when they were up there in, uh, off of Norway's coast there. Since then, they have actually come past the, uh, the English Channel. Very provocative when they come past. Now, I know that uh, some of the one, one girl, she writes for RT from time to time, she's a freelance journalist. She says, you know, all the hype that the, the British media was making about it, and uh, yet she made more light of it. Because I agree, no, Russia was not coming there to attack uh, the British, but Russia was also sending a message to Europe, both the Brits. Belgium, France, all these coasts that they're going right very close by. I mean, that's right by Calais. Uh, you got, you know, the British could easily see their flotilla going by uh, through the, when they went through the English Channel there. Uh, no doubt it could easily be seen from either, either shore. But what is Russia doing? They're letting the world know we have a force to be reckoned with as well. And they're headed into the Mediterranean because of the threat uh, from the, the United States, from Barack Obama, and his threat that they may use a military option to take out Assad, and of course the threat that they're going to take out all of the air defense systems. That's what John Kerry's leaked audio came out and said. So he knows there's a real threat, not just against Assad, but because his systems are there, the threat is against Russia as well. And as you just heard um, what Avi Lipkin said, they're, you know, the Amer America, the, uh, the United States, uh, Europe, NATO, they're trying to bring about a new world order. They're wanting to bring a one world government, in other words. Uh, and as the guy that slammed me here on, on, on the comments the other day, and he says, you're either part of the American Anglo-Israeli new world order, or you're not with us. You know, let me tell you something. 
neither the Americans nor the Israeli people are for your new world order. I can tell you that for a fact. You know, there may be a little small minority of maybe, you know, one-tenth of a percent in government powers that are for these new world orders, both Israeli and in American governments. But I can tell you one thing. The American people are not for a new world order, and neither are the Israeli people living in Israel. They're not for it either. All right, so that's just a bunch of garbage. All right, so Russia sending all these ships down there. A lot of people are worried, okay, what about Gog and Magog? What about the war that's going on there? Isn't this another issue that we're facing right now? All right, I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't think that we're looking at a, a uh, I'm actually trying to find a particular photo. I thought it was here. What happened to that rascal there? Uh, a Gog and Magog war, but uh, not, not in the case of Russia. And that's one thing I'm going to bring in. And Avi Lipkin would tell you the same. It's definitely not Russia. But I will say this, though. There's a little bit of truth in that because as Avi Lipkin br brings out, and this is what we're going to bring out when we bring out this issue on Gog, uh, Gog of Magog. Gog, you have to remember, he's the head. He's the king. He's the boss that runs all of this. But it's part of that ancient Turkish empire that even includes some of the former Soviet bloc states there north of the Black Sea. So yes, in that regard, some of that is true. But this was an ancient people, not the original Russians who migrated from Sweden that come across in Norway, the Scandinavians that ended up settling first in St. Petersburg and then later into Russia. Um, and of course, we do know that Istanbul, you know, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, um, the, the split of the Catholic Church, the Eastern, uh, you know, Orthodox believers, they end up going up into Moscow and call that their, their, um, you know, their, their own um, uh, New Jerusalem, uh, if you were at that time. But that's not what we're speaking about right now. Now, let's, let's get back on track here. There's a couple other things that I want to share with you here. Um, and this is an interesting one as well. This is where Avi is actually talking about um, Putin and who he really is. You know, you know how, how do Israelis feel about Russia, especially in light of Gog and Magog? Listen to this right here, what he says. He spent a lot of time in Jewish homes. He's talking about... Uh, he was very friendly with Jewish people, always. This is a great thing. Um, Putin's father was a communist. But his mother was a born-again Christian. Well, not born-again. She was Russian Orthodox. Very, very faithful Christian lady. She gave her son a gold cross on a chain, which he wears. He goes to church. Uh, I'm constantly getting from my friends in Greece pictures of Putin at religious ceremonies in monasteries in Greece. The Greek church and the Russian church are united. In other words, the Orthodox church are one, it's one church. Um... And Putin has a very excellent relationship with the rabbis in Russia, and the, the Jews have been doing actually pretty well. Now, the key to what I'm going to say is that Putin came out and said, what made Russia great is its Christianity. So there's a tremendous role reversal here. Russia was a Christian Orthodox country under the czars. Communists stopped that. And Putin stopped the communism, and he's reverting to the greatness of Russia, a la czarist Russia of the 1800s and early 1900s, and the return to the Russian Orthodox Church, and a Christian revival is part of the Russian Church. Now, we look back now at the United States. The United States is founded as a Christian country, one nation under God. And there was a great man by the name of Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman, who came in the 1800s, and he said, America will be the greatest country on earth because the American people are good people, which is true today also. Right. And their pulpits are on fire for the Lord. This is like 1830s. He said, America will lose its preeminence in the world when America's pulpits will no longer be on fire for the Lord. That's what's happening now. Yes, and, and, and Obama himself has said that America is the greatest Muslim country in the world. Greatest Muslim uh, so he's a prophet. He is bringing Islam to America and uh, subjugating Christianity. The Jews are going to be massacred. Some Christians will be massacred. But the bottom line is to make Christianity pariah, 
uh, the Bible pariah and replace it with the Quran and with Islam. So we have a role reversal. Whereas America was Christian, now it's Muslim uh, or atheist. Uh, now the and, and Russia, which was atheist, is now Christian. Okay. Uh, now, think about that, guys. Yeah. And and. Avi is right on that. That's, ex that's exactly what we're seeing happen. Now, some might argue right now and say, but Steve, recently Russia actually enacted laws banning certain Christianity and certain practices. All right? But our, I understand what you're saying. Russia is trying to stop the proselyting process, and I think the reason why Russia has done some of these laws here, because Putin remembers what happened to Russia when Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin took power, who were Jesuits, by the way. And one thing that uh, Avi Lipkin is saying here that he doesn't mention in here, there was one church that did flourish under communism. You know, not they, they still kept it low key, but only the Roman Catholic Church was allowed during that time, just like you have in China. Now, China cut it off. Uh, back, I think, uh, I forget what year it was, 56 or something like that, but they're reestablishing the relationship once again with Rome. Again, so the only church that's being allowed in China during the communist era is the Roman Catholic Church. But before communism came into China, Russia was doing, they were taking and going to China and bringing converts, etc., uh, etc., you know, bringing the people to, to the faith of Yeshua, to Jesus. All right. Now, I don't say that I agree with Eastern Orthodox uh, Christianity. That's totally different altogether. My point is, is Russia is not the atheistic way it was under communism. I still don't necessarily care for the way the laws are and the way they govern things there, but that's their business. They have a right to do what they want to do. All right. And uh, as far as the freedom of religion, I think freedom of religion should still be there. But you have to remember, like I said, Putin also knows the history of Russia and knows that the Catholic Church snuck Jesuits in and toppled the nations, toppled the czars with their Jesuits and brought in communism, an atheistic way, and to do away with all religions. And let me tell you something, that is the goal of the New World Order. Notice what the Pope of Rome was doing with the Mekodeshit in Israel. Remember us reporting this to you, the guy called it a faceless gathering. He said, in other words, there is no one religion that is supreme. And we don't call ourselves, even though we are Jews, Muslims, and Christians that are here, we don't come under any banner of any God. In other words, there's no Jesus, there is no uh, Yahweh for the Jews, none of that. None of that exists. But I know for a fact that Russia hasn't banned Christianity and things like people are saying. I've got a friend of mine going from America. Headed there, got a visa and everything. He's going there and taking Bibles with him. So, you know, not all of this, what we hear is true, that we hear about these things. Okay, so, uh, and as he stated there as well, what made Russia great was its Christians. That's what Putin said, all right? But everybody is scared because why? The West is demonizing Russia at this point. That's what we see happening right now. Now, a, a couple other things I want to share with you here um, as well. And um, oh, this is an article here. I wanted to bring this up to you real quick as well. This just came out uh, today. Kremlin says all of Syria must be liberated. Uh, this is an awakening. And, I, and I, like I said, I'm watching this very carefully. Are they working with the Turks on this? I don't really know, but this is what Moscow says uh, today. The, the entire territory of Syria must be liberated. Russian President Vladimir Putin's spokesman said in remarks and televised a Saturday dismissing demands for Syrian President Bashar Assad's departure as thoughtless. Uh, the Russian statement came as intense clashes were reported in northern Syria between Turkish troops and the Turkey-backed opposition fighters with Kurdish-led forces. The Syrian army commanded, command condemned the fresh offensive by Turkish troops inside Syria, describing it as an occupation that will be dealt with by all available means. Okay, so that was the Syrian army commander is saying that. That's in this report 
Russia is saying all the country must be liberated. The Turkish military intervened in the Syrian war in August this year under the orders from Ankara to clear the border uh, area of Islamic State of Iraq and Syria fighters and U.S.-backed Syrian Kurdish forces linked to Turkey's own outlawed Kurdish insurgency. The Turkish government considers both to be uh, terrorist groups. And by the way, another reason why you're seeing so many people arrested and imprisoned in Turkey by Erdogan is because Syria, as President Assad happens to be the Shiite and in the minority there, and in, in uh, Turkey, it's the other way around there as well. The Sunnis are in power, but they're still not the majority. About 50% of their nation are Shiites and Kurds. They make up the other half of the nation, which puts it very dangerous for that of uh, President Bashar al-Assad in the region. So he's trying to kill off all of his competition. It's becoming a bloodbath. I mean, I remember Albert Pike in the book that he wrote there, that's what he said. Create a war in the Middle East and have all the Arabs kill each other off and in the end turn them against the Jews and have them kill the Jews off. Wow, that sounds like a New World Order plan, doesn't it? That sounds like a Gog and Magog. Remember how it speaks in one part of the Bible as well? They have no regard for human life. And that's who Barack Hussein Obama is backing. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Now, there is another thing that I was hoping to find, and let me see if I can find it on here to see whether or not I brought it in. Uh, yes, it's at the 15-minute mark, and I think it's with my interview with Avi here, and I really want you to hear this here. This is the major plan of the One World Government, and so, yeah, let's catch this one right here uh, because you need to see what Avi says is coming, okay? Uh, I feel that, you know, I'm a Jew, and I, I, I cannot say I'm a Christian because I'm not a Christian, but I see things in the New Testament that make sense. And one of the things is, you know, we Jews and Christians together know Messiah is coming, coming, returning, and it's not far away, it's close. We know that there has to be a temple in Jerusalem, and we know that the so-called Antichrist will, will come to the temple and officiate. We know all of this is soon. Now, in order for a one-world government to impose such a thing, there can be no such thing as what we call today religious countries or it's nationalist intense. countries. Russia is a religious nationalist country today. Israel is a religious nationalist country today. These two countries have to be taken over by the one world government. This is the plan of the one world government. And then to the, the, the so-called one world government leader declares himself whatever he's going to declare himself before the Messiah shows up. Um, and I feel that these events are imminent. I feel Islam will be banished, not by the Jews and the Christians, mind you. Islam will be banished by the one world government whose God is mammon or God is money. And, you know, there are a lot of Russians that say, we want to be Europe. We, the Ukrainians, we don't want to be Russia. We want to be Europe. We want the standard of living. Russian people are good people, normal people. They want to eat and drink and have a happy life. And uh, maybe it's a fool's happiness to be part of the one world government. Uh, but this whole idea of Russian nationalism and a Russian religion, there, there are people in Russia who don't agree with it. And China, good question. What's going to happen with China? China is not a religious country. It's a communist country, so, but it is a nationalist country. So the one world government will say to China, listen, you're nationalists. As long as you join the one world government, we'll do business. Or Chinese will say, okay, Christians are only 10%. I mean, it's a joke. It's only 10%. 150 million Christians in China, praise God. Um, but uh, Russia has a deep-hearted soul faith. In, in Christ and in the church and everything that's going on. It's not been too good for the Jews in many instances. But like I said before, I feel that Putin uh, is a very good friend of Israel. He's in a very delicate position because he's doing a lot of business with Iran and a lot of business with other countries and with China. So you have two blocks. And I think the purpose of the one world government is to break apart the block, break China away from uh, Russia. and uh, Of course, North Korea, I don't think it's going to last very long. All right. Now, that's the point I wanted you to see there. The plan of the one world government, new world order as we often call it, is to stop nationalism. Now, if you notice, Avi said 
two major cup players, Russia and Israel, are both nationalistic countries. All right? And China, as he stated, they're not really worried about China as long as they want to do business. I noticed that when they put China's yen as part of the International Monetary Fund world currency. That gave China a fuzzy feeling inside and may very well cause China not to back Russia in a war. If Russia gets left out by itself against NATO, it's not going to be easy for Russia to win at all. Russia needs backing if they expect to win. And, you know, you have to understand, guys, you have, let me put it to you like this. How many of you that listen to this broadcast right now have been against a new world order? Probably 95% of those that listen to this broadcast don't want nothing to do with a new world order. You know, it brings about an antichrist, as Avi says, brings about your mark of the beast. All that comes from a new world order. Well, there's one nation standing up against it. Assad, by the way, is against it too. That's why he's being toppled over. All these nations that were against it, why do you think they said they wanted to go to war? Why do you think General Wesley Clark uh, comes out and tells the world that, you know, the, the America had already decided we're going to war against Iraq, uh, Syria, we're going to topple Lebanon, we're going to topple and give this whole list of countries that they're going to topple. Libya, Yemen, all these countries have to be toppled. Why? New world order. Hegemony. It's not the United States is going to be the head of the new world order. It's Rome. And as he said, the nationalistic countries they have to bring down. How will they bring Israel down then? Because we are a nationalist country. The United States is a nationalist country. But Obama has done an extremely good job of wrecking that. So what do they have a plan for America then? They want to ban Christianity? Pretty much. That's what they're up to. You know, if you're going to have your belief, believe me, you're not going to be on YouTube doing it. Hillary gets in. Freedom of religion will end. Freedom of the Internet will end. Freedom of speech will end. A whole new world order is all about ending all of this. And Russia, Putin, they have been trying to kill him for a long time. Wait till I've got a very special broadcast about an assassination attempt that was done on Putin that you probably don't even know about. And they made a major mistake and got the wrong one. I'll just say it like that. But, so, they need to bring Russia down. And if Israel is nationalistic, how are they going to bring Israel down? I think they're going to allow a war. I've been saying this for a long time. I think uh, Hezbollah eventually will end up attacking Israel from the north. They're going to probably have ISIS attack us from the east. Because believe me, if the U.S. wins again and topples Syria, what are they going to put in to power in, in Syria? Al-Nusra? Al-Qaeda? Al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS and the moderate rebels, they're all working together. That's what's going to be in power in Syria? Do you think Israel has had problems with Assad? We're going to really have some problems in. And that's why they're setting it up like this, guys. They're doing it so that they can bring Israel down. Believe me, we have got some thugs inside the government there. And Shimon Peres was no different. They call him, he's a great man of peace and everything. He got the Nobel Peace Prize. He was a Vatican puppet. Jeez, let me let me share with you something here. Barry Chamish, let's, where are you at, Barry? Me and Barry, we, we did interviews together. Barry told me about the assassination attempts on his life while he was in Israel, told me about things privately. He briefly mentions it on here. He doesn't go into it too deep, but um, I, I, I'm so sad to see that Barry died. You know, Barry, very outspoken. Uh, but, you know, he didn't play around. Let's go to the 3150 mark here. This is where Barry gets into the transfer agreement, but he barely gets into it. This is a little bit of a historical side for you to show you what happened at the creation of the state of Israel. Again, I make it clear. I know prophetically we were going to return to our homeland. Now, Barry doesn't agree with these things. He didn't agree with me on these type things here, but... You know, he knows that we got there. He said, let's make the best of as we can. That was Barry's way of looking at it. 
because Barry knew historically what they were doing to the Jews. And they were exterminating our families in the Holocaust. Some made it, some didn't. Some wanted to go to America. They turned the ship back. But they only wanted a certain number to go into Israel so the Vatican could control it. Watch what Barry says about this. I think this will be an educational moment for sure. Agreement and this, this disgusting agreement between the labor Zionists and the Nazis uh, to get their kind of Jews out of Germany uh, with British compliance uh, to get their nations uh, started. Uh, and the fact that Adolf Eichmann went, went to Palestine and had a grand old time at the Kibbutzim, admiring the beautiful girls. And, and then uh, when he, he was in charge of 500,000 Jews in Budapest, uh, Rudolf Kastner uh, could have freed all 500,000. He didn't want them. But Kastner said, no, here's a list. You save these guys, the rest can go to hell. Uh, he put on Nazi uniforms, went to death camps. You start getting into uh, the real history of Israel. It, it's the worst thing that ever happened to the Jews. And worst thing he said that ever happened to the Jews. Now, I don't know if you can understand Barry well enough on there. Uh, but what Barry was talking about is when uh, Eichmann came down, visited a kibbutz, married a Jewish girl, goes back, uh, and they had the opportunity to, to in Austria to rescue 500,000 Jews and let them go to Israel. But they didn't. Or I'm sorry, Eichmann, I believe, is the one that handed down the orders. You can rescue these here. They can go to Israel, kill the rest. Or as he put it, they can go to hell. That's what he says. And this is the shame. This, this is how they begin to create the state. This is why you see that Shimon Perez went to a Jesuit school. Only certain families could get into power. And I knew this from the Bielski family as well. So, again, we have our own inside sources that we find out these things and we know these things to be true. Um, you know, and let me just, I want you to hear just a, a little bit on this right here as well. This is the, uh, we go to the 35 minute mark right here where Barry talks about the Oslo Accords here. Uh, and this is what we've been working on ourselves. This is one reason why me and Barry would team up from time to time um, and, and do interviews together there. Uh, we, we published a lot of Barry's work as well. And I, I really believe that, you know, he was found in his apartment. He lived in Florida. He lived not far from me in Florida. When we, we lived in Fort Myers, Barry was only just an hour, hour and a half north of where I lived at there. Uh, so it made it easy, us, easy for us to be able to communicate together. But watch what Barry says right here. I had a meeting with him at a Tel Aviv big cafe right after he signed the Oslo Accord. He thought I was one of him, and I was with my friend Joel Bainerman. And in short, Yossi Bainerman worked behind the back of his boss. He was the deputy foreign minister. Paris was foreign minister. Rabin didn't want Paris to know about the Oslo secret meetings, so they kept it from him. Paris found out in March of 19... March, yes. By May, he sent a letter uh, to the Pope, um, delivered by, uh, um, oh my goodness, a, a monarch halter, yes, the French intellectual, offering Jerusalem if he would come and be with him in the Oslo Peace Accords. And I've got the whole story, and it's so well We'll put it together later, then, where it gives you more time to... Yes. So as you hear, uh, Barry, actually, they thought that he was in agreement with them about the Oslo Accords. So therefore, one of the foreign ministers there for Israel actually was speaking with him and telling him everything about what was going on. And all the while, uh, Yitzhak Rabin was keeping from, uh, keeping from, uh, uh, Shimon Perez about the Oslo Accords, and then when he got wind of it, as Barry says here, then he sends a, a letter to the Pope of Rome telling him that he'll give him Jerusalem if he lets him become part of this. So we were sold out by Shimon Perez. Remember, the sons of the lawless over in Daniel chapter 11, again, I think that's around verse 16, verse 14, something, something to that effect there. Um, so 
you know, um, let's see here. All right, I think we, we've pretty much covered everything on that right there. So it's just, it's really sad what's going on. And yes, like we say here, Russia, Turkey signed a gas pipeline deal. So how is this going to play out with Russia and Turkey in the region there? Uh, I don't know. And, 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 and Turkey is not taking out, they're not taking out anyone that is ISIS. In fact, in another article, it says the ISIS troops just stepped out of the way. But Turkey shells Kurdish fighters in Aleppo province. U.S.-backed Kurdish rebels come under Turkish attack in uh, the Sheikh Issa town and other areas in northern Aleppo province there. Uh, the, the Turks claim that they killed, this was on October 21st, claim that they killed at least uh, 150 of the Kurds in this. And this is where this is when Assad says, if you do any more firing on the Kurds, then he's going to take out their warplanes as a result of that. Uh, and now we're finding that the Kurds are, uh, excuse me, the Turks are right here. If you look on your screen here, I showed you the other day they were up here in Maria. They moved into there. They're also now moving into El, uh, El, uh, El Bad, uh, or Dab, excuse me, uh, and the Kurds are on their way to meet them there as well. And again, uh, both areas there, only eight, kilom eight miles from uh, Aleppo's uh, center city there. And I don't know if, if Turkey is planning on stopping there, but I've also got another report there that not only has the uh, Turkish government now laid claims to Mosul as part of their territory, now they're claiming all of this area here of northern uh, Syria belongs to them, and he is vowing to take it back. I think that the United States and uh, NATO are using Turkey to be a part of setting up their new world order. They are Sunnis, by the way. They are a NATO member. And believe me, it, this is who he's going to use to muster his military powers. When it comes time for Gog to strike Israel, I think they're going to use Turkey to do it with. But the leader will be coming right out of the Vatican. That's what I want to lay down for you. And also, I know that uh, most people believe that Russia is part of uh, Gog, of Magog, mostly because of uh, Gordon Lindsay's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, uh, was made, really made that popular. Even uh, Ronald Reagan in 1971 at a congressional meeting before he ever became president had, had also uh, spoke about that Russia, you could, he said, you couldn't have said Russia was Gog, Years ago, for, 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 he said, for nearly a thousand years, they were a Christian nation. But since the communism, he says, now they fit the bill. But even Gordon Lindsay misinter or not misinterpreted, but mistranslated uh, the ancient documents by Pliny and even that of Josephus, and therefore made the error in uh, bringing Gog as being part of Russia when it never was a part of Russia. It's actually a part of Western, far west of, uh, of the Turkish Empire there. And also, during the Turkish Empire, that encompassed even uh, to the edge of Italy there. So you're going to find some interesting things when we do bring this out. Anyway, I probably held you guys long enough. I apologize for the length of this. And I hope it also clears up for those of you uh, that do love Israel. Understand, we love Israel very much ourselves. But, you know, just like we love America, but I can't accept what Obama has been doing in the country. We have to call what's true true, and what's wrong is wrong. And it's the same with the Israeli government as well. We are looking for the coming of the Mashiach, the second coming as a believer in Yeshua. I'm looking for this, his return. But the thing is, just like in the case of David, when David left, what did David say to those two uh, priest there, he says, get the people in one heart and one mind and one accord, then call me back, then I'll come back, then I can come in to the promised land. Well, God has got to have two witnesses that get Israel in one mind and one accord. And believe me, they're not going to rally them behind the government. Not to say that there's not a government there, but they're going to rally them behind the word of God, the prophets of old, and show them where they missed the mark. That is what God is going to do. And that's what will cause the nations to take hold of the skirt of a hymn that is a Jew and say, 
tell us your ways. We hear God is with you. And that those people of the nations, that even includes the, the Muslim people. But they will never take the hold of a skirt of, of, of what we have right now in Israel that is leading Israel as a nation when they're out there knowingly doing evil to their neighbors. That'll never come about in that type of situation. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Here of Tov.